And now on to a lecture 11, where we'll be discussing radar waveforms and pulse compression. Uh, here's the block diagram of the radar, and here is where we do the pulse compression process, and here is where we generate the waveforms that we're going to transmit. And we're going to talk about what goes what kind of waveforms we transmit and why, and how they're processed in the receiver. And we're going to talk about a technique called pulse compression, which I'll define during the lecture. First a section, we're going to introduce you to radar waveforms and their properties and talk about matched filters. Then we'll talk about pulse compression, introduce it, the different types of pulse compression, and then summarize. Now, as we know from the earlier lectures, a radars work on the general principle, or pulse radars work on the general principle, that a pulse of energy is sent out. Where we, uh, that pulse is, it has a length time, a pulse width, we, here we have T, and when within that pulse width, we send out what we've been calling up to now, up to now what we've been, um, assuming is the sinusoidal microwave electromagnetic wave. In this case, it's a one microsecond long uh, um, square enveloped pulse of energy. If we look at the power spectrum of that pulse, we see the power here in units going from 20 to minus 20 dB, um, the bandwidth of that pulse is 1 over T, which is about um, a little over, about a megahertz wide. And roughly speaking, the um, bandwidth is 1 over the, the length of the pulse. So if it's a one microsecond pulse, we'd have a one, mic a one megahertz bandwidth. Range resolution, delta R is proportional to the pulse width. Delta R is CT over 2. And inversely proportional to the bandwidth. So if we go to higher bandwidth, we'll go to smaller resolution. And a, a 1 megahertz of bandwidth corresponds to about 150 meters of range resolution. Now one thing we remember from the, we should remember from the radar equation is that we want as much energy on the target as possible. Later on when we get to transmitters, you'll see that the the, the sources that which we generate microwave power have limited peak powers for a given design. So we'd want to make, to, to get further out in range, we'd want to make the time length of the pulse longer and longer. But as we make that pulse width longer and longer, our range resolution will get longer and longer and will, and our ability to resolve two targets will be less. So there's, we, there's something we'd like, greater detectability at further ranges, and there's something you get you don't like, and that's greater error in knowing where the target is, poorer range resolution. And that's something we're going to be dealing with in pulse compression. Now, what are match filters? Um, a match filter, it, it, by definition, it maximizes the peak signal to mean ratio, the peak signal to the mean noise ratio. For a rectangular pulse, uh, the match filter is a simple bandpass filter. And you can see, here's the pulse spectrum of that pulse. The matched filter that you want to send the returned echo through to maximize the signal-to-noise ratio is just 
the phase reversed pulse. And this, of course, assumes that um, we have a, an average noise power. It's white Gaussian noise. And the peak of that is 2 times the energy divided by N0. And the energy is just the power times the time. So if we're dealing with a radar whose background is only noise, it's very simple. You just um, pass the received signal after it's come back from the, echo, the, the target, echoed back, through the, the time-reversed signal, a match filter, which is this characteristics, and you will get an output that maximizes your signal-to-noise ratio. Now, if one wants the received signal-to-noise ratio through a filter that optimizes the signal-to-noise ratio, that's what we want, as I just said. For white Gaussian noise, the frequency response of the matched filter is given just by this, where this is the complex conjugate, uh, which we saw visually in the previous view graph, of complex conjugate of the Fourier transform of the transmitted signal times uh, an amplitude factor. And with a little manipulation, we see that the, the system function is equal to this, the frequency response, the magnitude, is just equal to the frequency response of that Fourier transform with a phase being negative, which again I showed you visually on the last view graph. Now in Chapter 5, Section 2 of Skolnik Reference 1, it repeats the classic derivation of a matched filter response for a simple pulse and Gaussian noise. It does it faster and a little more rigorously. And what it states is that the output peak instantaneous signal to mean noise ratio depends only on the total energy of the received signal and the noise power per unit bandwidth. And the average signal to noise ratio used in the radar equation calculations is the average signal to noise ratio, not the peak. And that differs from the above by a factor of two. That's why you see a difference between S over N and 2E over N. Now, note the previous discussion always assumes that the signal only competes with uniform white noise. Now, just for a minute, think back of that PPI that I showed you of um, Atlantic City, where there was just the buildings and a little bit of clutter and it's got over to the side that big rain cloud. We saw black everywhere, which meant that there was no signals. Uh, and it just there was one, one, one or two places where there were targets that came through. So um, it was a perfect match filter to optimize the signal to noise ratio where we had white Gaussian noise. But 80% of a typical radar's coverage this is true, that it's, you're just competing with noise. But the echoes from clutter are far from true as being white Gaussian noise-like. And these include ground, rain, sea, birds, etc. Birds are real targets. And these types of backgrounds are colored noise. They have a frequency response that's not random in frequency. And that the target competes with having a spectrus that are very different than Gaussian noise. And the optimum match filters need to be used in de to deal with clutter when you have these kinds of backgrounds that are cluttered, that are colored, excuse me. And we're going to discuss those in detail in lectures 12 and in lectures 13. How do you deal with this colored noise? And I'm going to just preface it by saying, notice I talked about one for just Gaussian noise. I assume just one pulse going in or a number of pulses that you just coherently integrate 
remember back from our detection lectures, and it, everything would be true and wonderful. But that 15, 20 percent of the radar's coverage, if you have a million cells, can give you hundreds or thousands of false alarms in a radar's coverage in a single scan, and you don't want that. So you, we're going to need to discuss optimum filtering with colored noise. And to optimally filter and shape Doppler filters, either passband or um, low high pass filters, whatever they may be, we're going to have to take a different tack. And to design those filters, we're not going to just be processing with coherently one pulse, but we're going to be coherently processing many pulses and weight those different pulses such that the output, the frequency response of the signals back with their weighted output is going to give you the optimum response that will minimize ground, rain, sea, and birds. Okay. Now, now let's just look at how for a single pulse we would implement the match filter. We have the reflected echo and we have a time reversed of the, of the, set of the, of the simple transcript pulse. And what we implement it with is a convolution. And the simplest way of this is a convolution which you know from your systems theory and we went over it in the, in the signal processing stuff up front. Uh, we move the digitized pulses by each other in steps. That's just what the sum does. It, 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 it flips in time and samples and sums. So let's just look at with with blue being this reflected echo and red being the time reversed echo we're going to pass one by the other and assume that this signal has been digitized at, at these different common time intervals sampled we move them by and here we have no overlap when we do the multiplication so the, the output is zero so the output of the match filter would be zero and then this is what the samples would look like here's x of n and here's the time reversed pulse h of minus n and with no output then if we move to the next integer sub integer n here we'll have one place where there's overlap and these are unit size just a unit in size to show you as an example that will be one times one only one will be one one element of the sum will be non-zero and so one times one is one and so we have the output of the match filter here is one and if we slide that window over one more sample and we'll have one times one plus one times one gives us two so the output of the matched filter will be here and here we have the, the all three overlap we'll get a three and then we'll be back to two because there will only be two samples that overlap four and then five and notice this has the shape that, uh, that was pictorially shown to you. So this shows you how the convolution works. And we use a match filter to ma maximize the signal to noise ratio when we have a single pulse and, and Gaussian noise. And when we, we're going to use convolution in pulse compression to do match filtering and that's why I wanted to go over this with you. We'll end this part of the lecture right here.